Hello, thank you for choosing to join me for this second in the series about appetite support of cats, the anorexic cat. And today's session is all about how we can support voluntary food intake in our cats that are anorexic or inappetent. As usual, if you'd like a, a copy of the slides I use or any other resources, um, please do feel free to get in touch uh, via uh, the website or the email address that I've put up on the slide here. So what's a sensible starting point for our anorexic cat? Uh, we've assessed the cat as per our last session where we talked about triage of anorexic cats. We've done as detailed a history and a physical exam as we possibly can to try and work out what's causing the anorexia. But what should we do next? Well, I think the starting point really is to think, what can I find that is fixable? What can I find that I can actively help in this patient? And there's a whole host of things that might fall into that sort of category. There are things that we might find on our physical examination, for example, dehydration. If you're dehydrated, your appetite's likely to be poor. Dehydration is very straightforward for us to correct. But also there may be things that we find uh, on our um, physical examination or on our lab tests, if we do initial lab tests, if we're worried enough about our patient to be thinking about what support is needed that might also emerge. So, for example, anemia, um, electrolyte disturbances um, and the really classic and really important electrolyte disturbance to always remember in cats is hypokalemia, low blood potassium levels. Cats are very, very dependent on potassium in their food and in having a healthy appetite in order to maintain normal blood levels of potassium. And if they're potassium levels start to drop if they become hypokalemic. Um, this often causes some weakness, lethargy, poor appetite. So you can see that irrespective of what caused the poor appetite, then development of hypokalemia can perpetuate that. So if we identify uh, hypokalemia, we should treat it and that should uh, often cause some improvement in, the, in our patient's clinical signs. And it again is in that category of things that are straightforward for us to be able to do. So you can get vials of potassium chloride, uh, such as the, the picture shown on the slide here, and that can be added to your intravenous fluids or even subcut fluids if you have a cat that's uh, just coming into the, the clinic for some subcutaneous fluid support, and that will help make a big difference. So think about all of these possibilities. What might be present in the cat? What can you sort out? Beyond that, what are the next steps that we can choose that will hopefully help improve voluntary food intake? Well, on this slide, I've just included some suggestions for the nursing, uh, what I would call TLC, tender loving care, that a carer at home might be able to do or that in the clinic, uh, nursing support staff might be able to help with. And just some reminders here of, of what works and what doesn't work in cats. So for example, uh, warming the food slightly, making it a bit more or aromatic is, is often a helpful thing to do, um, but an unhelpful thing to do might be to surround that anorexic cat with um, every food that you've got either in your house at home if you're an owner or every food that you've got in your hospital if you're in a vet clinic so that the cat has uh, perhaps a circle of food bowls around it, each very strong smelling, uh, very aromatic foods. Um, that can be, of course, completely off-putting and overwhelming. And uh, I think if you imagine yourself feeling ill, perhaps you've got gastroenteritis and then someone puts you at a, at a banquet table, um, probably the last thing you're ever going to do is, is to have any of that food to eat. So um, general tactics that are helpful would include sitting with the cat, stroking the cat, grooming the cat. Again, this is the sort of thing a carer can do at home. Some cats will respond to catnip on the food. Uh, this is the, um, the plant Nepeteria in the garden that cats like. And there's, uh, they have a gene which either means they like catnip or, or they, if they don't have that gene, they don't like catnip. But uh, dried catnip sprinkled on the food can be helpful. Some cats also, Fortiflora, the Purina supplement, um, can actually help uh, with appetite stimulation, I find, as a just very, very uh, mild and very non-specific sort of enhancement. Um, offering, of course, foods that are more strong smelling, tempting foods, things like prawns or freshly cooked chicken or fish, all these sorts of things, as per usual, um, are going to have a, a, a nice uh, stimulating input as well. 
but of course many of our anorexic cats that are significantly unwell all of these uh, general support tips uh, are not always going to have as much of an impact as we would like so beyond that what can we consider well, I've talked already about looking for the fixable things. So looking for evidence of things like dehydration, but also looking for evidence of pain, nausea as possible causes of that poor appetite. Um, but at this point, a treatment trial, an empirical treatment trial may also be something that is worth considering depending on the patient and the severity and your judgment on what level of support is appropriate. So for example, uh, in a cat where you're not concerned about dehydration, and you're not concerned about kidney function, perhaps non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like meloxicam might be worth a try to see if, if there is any sort of pain uh, responsible for that cat's poor appetite. If you're concerned about nausea and vomiting, then perhaps meropotent as a trial may be worth considering. But this is also the point where having tried to sort of find and fix as many of those problems uh, that we talked about at the start as we can is a logical point to also think about appetite stimulants. And before I talk about appetite stimulants, I just wanted to briefly mention uh, syringe feeding, which is, of course, not a voluntary food intake, but it's often the sort of thing that, in my experience, a client will think about doing at this point, um, because uh, syringe feeding superficially liquid food uh, via syringe into the cat might seem like a sensible plan from a, an owner's perspective. Um, but of course, any of you that have had experience of this in any of your patients, uh, or indeed in your own cats, will know that in fact, it, it typically is not possible for a start to actually get an adequate nutrition into a cat through syringe feeding. The volume of food that you need to actually just provide resting energy requirements is typically very large. So so um, I've put on this slide some information on liquid diets and their calorie content and you can see typically it's about one to one and a half calories per mil and for a four kilo cat that means you're going to typically need 150 to 200 mils of this liquid food to provide that cat's daily resting energy requirements and the thought of syringing 200 mils into a cat is uh, you know is very difficult and most cats will really dislike this approach and that therefore can make it very counterproductive both in terms of causing a lot of stress um, fear of their carer if the carer is doing it or of any staff in the hospital if that's the case a risk of aspiration and pneumonia also a very significant risk of it causing a food aversion where the cat then starts to associate food with uh, unpleasantness and therefore decides, well, I'm just not going to eat. So syringe feeding is almost um, certainly something that I would I would never bring up with a carer, but if they volunteer, I have syringe fed my cat in the past and I would like to try this, I will have a serious discussion with them about the many disadvantages and concerns of syringe feeding. Um, very occasionally it can work, but for the most part, it's just not something that is tolerated adequately to be the correct thing to do, in my opinion. So the next step then is to consider about appetite stimulants and appetite stimulants certainly can be useful in improving voluntary food intake. There's quite a lot of uh, appetite stimulating agents or potentially appetite stimulating agents that have been used in cats. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about metazapine and cyproheptadine to start with. Um, but there is quite a long, long list of other, uh, other agents that people have used. Um, and at the moment, there's nothing licensed in in the UK for treatment of appetite support. Um, but in the United States, a transdermal metazapine is licensed as Mirataz. And uh, also for dogs, uh, Capromelin uh, is uh, licensed in, uh, as trade name Entice uh, for appetite support of dogs. So if you're working in, in the United States, you will have some licensed options available to you for your canine and feline patients. Oral metazapine has been used for many years now as an effective appetite stimulant in cats um, and it's not a veterinary licensed product in, in an oral formulation anywhere in the world to my knowledge um, but we are lucky that actually some good studies have been done looking at uh, pharmacokinetics and the appropriate dosing of cats using this product. Um, metazapine is very helpful because it's not only an appetite stimulant but it also has some anti-emetic effects so it's quite good for cats that have nausea uh, as well as poor appetite. 
the suggested dosing regime based on work by Jessica Quimby um, is that in cats with good kidney and liver function, a dose of two milligrams per cat per day is safe. Um, if you have a cat with chronic kidney disease, the dose frequency should be reduced to every 48 hours. So that's two milligrams per cat every 48 hours. In fact, my own experience, I often actually find starting at a lower dose, one milligram per cat um, is actually often effective effective and particularly with small cats that higher dose two milligrams can be associated with some side effects of uh, metazapine and, and that would typically be agitation, restlessness, vocalization which of course wears off as the drug is metabolized but can be a bit distressing for the owner often they'll report uh, that the cat is pacing around the house and vocalizing and just won't sit still. But where you do need to go up to two milligrams per cat, that should be safe based on, based on the knowledge we have from Jessica Quimby's research. More recently in the United States, a transdermal metazapine has been licensed and this is called Mirataz. And interestingly, the dose um, protocol is the same as oral use of metazapine. And I say interestingly, because usually with transdermal medications, products that are applied to the skin and that pass through the skin and into the bloodstream, usually you need a higher dose to be as effective as the oral route. But for some reason with metazapine, uh, it does seem to be quite well absorbed and therefore the same dosing protocol is suggested. In the UK we don't have Miritaz but we do have specials labs, these are laboratories that have a license to be able to produce um, uh, non-licensed products for use in animals um, and we have a number of these that produce products for use in, in cats and that includes Summit, Bova and PCCA and all of these do produce a transdermal metazapine product which is very helpful uh, for us to be able to use in our patients. I wanted to very briefly mention cyproheptadine, um, not because I use it very much. In fact, I haven't used this product for, for many years now, uh, but prior to metazapine uh, being available and us knowing about it, this was often something that I used. So just in case you're, you're working somewhere where perhaps metazapine is not as readily available and cyproheptadine is, this might be something of interest to you. Cyproheptadine is an antihistamine and it also has some appetite stimulating effects in cats. And what I would refer to as a, a gentle nudge to, to encourage the cat to eat. So I, I don't think it is quite as effective as metazapine, uh, but I did uh, in the past use this a lot and found it very helpful, for example, in cats with chronic kidney disease with a persistent poor appetite. And typically a dose of one to two milligrams per cat. Um, and you can use it um, twice a day if need be, but you can also use it as needed. So it doesn't have to be given every day if the cat doesn't need it. And actually the same uh, approach approach to long-term medication would be true of metazapine as well. If the cat is having a good appetite on a day, it doesn't need its metazapine. There was a list of other products that, uh, that I included on an earlier slide that have been used as appetite stimulants uh, in cats and uh, diazepam in the past, way, way, way back, uh, for example, was one that was used, um, but is not something that I would recommend, uh, partly because it's not very effective. The cat's often quite floppy and, and uh, sedate on this and quite an abnormal eating response, uh, but also there have been reports of uh, idiosyncratic uh, liver toxicity in cats receiving which is another reason to, to avoid diazepam if possible and similarly oxazepam for the same reasons. Uh, B vitamins, anabolic steroids, um, well I think some debate as to how effective these are um, but they are potentially an option if that is perhaps all that you have available to you. I would rather not use glucocorticoids or progestogens because of the, the risk of side effects which are quite significant with both of these medications and with glucocorticoids of course you might be masking an underlying disease which would be better diagnosed and treated specifically. But the last on the list is capromelin, um, which is this uh, ghrelin agonist uh, known as entice in the United States. And I, I may have been pronouncing some of these words incorrectly because it's not something available to me, but uh, I'm pretty sure entice is pronounced uh, as, uh, as I've said it. But this is a fairly new product, which is licensed for dogs. Um, ghrelin is known as the hunger hormone produced in the gastrointestinal tract, um, acting on the brain to, to signal uh, that you're hungry. 
sorry. Um, and so when the stomach is empty, it's produced and released and that stimulates uh, eating and appetite. When you're full, uh, production of this is, is suppressed. So this is something that's that's available in the United States and some people have tried using it in cats as well, which I, I think uh, has been associated with some success, although the product is a marshmallow flavour, which I, I'm told is is not too popular with patients that where this has been tried. And now that there is an FDA approved appetite stimulant in the form of Miritaz, the metazapine transdermal I mentioned, I think it probably is not being used widely uh, for appetite support because there is essentially a better alternative alternative available. But this may or may not be available to you and therefore including uh, for comparison and for your interest. So in summary from today's session, really I think the, the key things are use your history and physical examination to try and get to the bottom of the cause of the poor appetite because of course addressing that cause is going to have the best possible outcome. But also look for those complications which you can fix. Things like dehydration, things like hypokalemia, very straightforward to fix and that in itself might be all you need to do to restore appetite don't start appetite stimulants before you've fixed those things. But then from an appetite stimulant uh, front, I would choose metazapine where, where you have that available to you because I do think it is very effective, generally very well tolerated as well and can be used long term where that is needed. Um, so it's very, uh, very helpful, particularly for those chronic uh, cases of poor appetite such as cats with chronic kidney disease. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, just a reminder of what's coming next in the series. So uh, the next session in two weeks time today is how to place a nasoesophageal feeding tube in a cat. So if that's of interest, please join me then. Also a reminder that on the website, there are a lot of resources which support these sessions and other topics as well. So have a look in the helpful info section for technical guides, as well as uh, videos of previous, uh, <coughs> excuse me, webinars that I've done. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, also the books, uh, there's some CPD on the website as well. Um, and last but not least, just to mention that we have got some surveys open at the moment uh, that we would really appreciate your help with. Um, the key one that I want to really plug today, um, which is on our survey page, is about people's experience of telemedicine. This is where phone video or email consultations have been done with your clients because of uh, social distancing in this uh, COVID um, pandemic that we're all experiencing. So if you have used telemedicine at all for your feline patients, I'd really love you to fill in our survey, which you can find on the website. And also if you have clients that have used telemedicine, we have a separate survey uh, open for clients to ask of their experience of telemedicine for cats. Um, and if you could uh, share those surveys with anyone that you think might be able to help, I'd be really, really grateful. And we will be aiming to publish the results of these surveys as soon as possible so that we can share people's knowledge and experience um, as far and wide as we, as we possibly can. So thank you very much for, for joining me today. Um, and I will now have a look and see if there are any questions in the chat box and uh, hope that uh, we can have some good discussion. Thank you very much.